Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Jack Reitrick, and I'm a pediatric cardiologist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Welcome to Pediatric and Congenital Heart Talks, a series of lecture presentations and discussions on interesting and important topics in our field of pediatric and congenital heart care. In this series, we will share insights on a variety of topics, offer new perspectives on some basic principles, introduce novel concepts and innovations, as well as identify what needs to come next to solve challenging problems in our field. Our objectives are to provide education on a variety of topics, but also perhaps to stimulate some provocative thought on your part. We'd love to hear from you and to get your questions and thoughts on these discussions. You can contact us at this email address, chopheartalks at email.chop.edu. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. For patients today born with single ventricle type congenital heart disease, a pathway for survival has been described and defined. We don't have a cure for these patients. We cannot take a single ventricle heart and turn it into a normal two ventricle heart, not yet. However, the pathway of survival for these patients is through the rerouting of the circulation such that venous return makes its way without the benefit of a subpulmonary ventricle into the pulmonary circulation. We refer to that as the Fontan circulation. We're going to hear from David Goldberg, uh, a colleague, good friend of mine, who is an associate professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dave has developed a strong interest in the Fontan circulation, and in particular, uh, has been focusing his attention on ways in which we can potentially improve the circulation through pharmacological manipulation. So Dave is going to talk to us uh, today about what therapies improve the Fontan circulation. Dave, I'm looking forward to your talk, and uh, I know we share a lot of interests, uh, and I'm also looking forward to the uh, conversation we're going to have after your presentation on some of the aspects of the physiology of the Fontan circulation and perhaps how we can make it somewhat better. Thanks, Jack. I'm looking forward to giving the talk. It's nice to be here with you. Um, virtually, and, and uh, nice to have the opportunity to talk about some of the work that you and I have done, among, uh, among others, over the years um, in our efforts to improve the efficiency uh, of the Fontan. So I'm looking forward to uh, this talk, and I appreciate the opportunity to share. So uh, as many people know, the Fontan operation, as Jack alluded to, is the culmination of a series of palliative procedures that has allowed for the survival of generations of children born with single ventricle heart disease. Uh, in the early days, the Fontan operation was associated with a fair amount of risk. There was uh, nearly 10% incidence of early death following the Fontan, um, and a certain number of patients had to have Fontan reversal for failure to tolerate the procedure as well. Um, over the decades since those early days, our we've become more experienced with the Fontan procedure, um, and the early mortality and morbidity has really uh, decreased significantly. However, the Fontan circulation comes with a big warning. There are two fundamental flaws with the circulation set up by the total cavopulmonary connection. The first is low cardiac output. The amount of blood that the heart pumps in a given minute is lower than that which uh, would, would occur in a normal two ventricle circulation. And the second is that the pressure within the great veins and all the veins really of the body are elevated after the Fontan operation with consequences for organ systems outside the heart. So these are some of the of the sort of worst complications um, that we worry about after the Fontan procedure. On the left is a child with um, lower extremity edema uh, caused in part by protein losing enteropathy. And you can see he has a big gash on his uh, right leg and the wound healing uh, on that gash is, is, um, is incredibly delayed. Um, and he had a pretty profound cellulitis associated with that. Um, in the middle there, that, what the structure that looks like a chicken foot is actually a plastic cast or a cast of the bronchus, 
caused by the accumulation of lymphatic fluid in the airways over a period of time. Next to that is a patient um, with end-stage protein-losing enteropathy. Uh, you can notice a lot of peripheral muscle wasting. wasting. You can notice the pretty massive um, ascites and hepatomegaly. Um, and then next to that is, a, is an image of um, a liver biopsy where you can see an enormous amount of scarring and fibro fibrotic change within the structure of the liver itself. So the Fontan circulation isn't perfect. Um, in the most recent review of the, of the uh, data from CHOP, we found a 20-year survival of about 74%. Um, there are indications that it's gotten better uh, over recent decades, uh, but still we're not where we would really like to be. Um, and in addition to uh, the diminished survival, there's also a real risk of reintervention. The 20 year freedom from reintervention is only 35% after Fontan. So in the early days, we talked about the Fontan as the final palliative stage of, of reconstructive surgery for single ventricle. We know now that that's not true. For the overwhelming majority, there are uh, a multitude of other procedures and interventions uh, after the Fontan. So what are the goals of therapy for the Fontan? Well, really, we want to try and target the two fundamental flaws. The Fontan leads to decreased cardiac output. We want to try and increase cardiac output. The Fontan causes increased central venous pressure which has many effects on other organ systems, we want to decrease that central venous pressure. So what are the best ways to do that? Well, what determines the cardiac output? Well, the cardiac output, um, or pulmonary blood flow in this case, is determined by the pressure change across the pulmonary vascular bed divided by the pulmonary vascular resistance. And this is Poisieux's law. If we rearrange that a little bit, we can solve for the pulmonary vascular resistance, which is equal to the change in pressure divided by uh, pulmonary uh, blood flow. So if we can find a pharmacodynamic therapy that can lower pulmonary vascular resistance, that means that either the pressure uh, across the pulmonary vascular bed will go down and we will lower central venous pressure, or cardiac output will go up, or potentially a combination of both. So what are the ways to attack um, the pulmonary vascular resistance? Well, there's really three main pathways. There's the endo uh, endothelin pathway, um, where endothelin 1 binds to endothelin receptor A or endothelin receptor B, and we have a series of endothelin receptor antagonists that can block that uh, and, re and sort of counteract the vasoconstriction and smooth muscle proliferation associated with, the, with that pathway. There's also the prostacyclin pathway. Um, which likewise, uh, which uh, uh, in contradistinction to the endothelin pathway, the prostacyclin pathway leads to vasodilation and anti-proliferation. So prostacyclin derivatives are used to sort of spur that pathway uh, or ramp it up um, to cause vasodilation and to um, counter uh, proliferation of the smooth muscle. And then the third pathway, the one that I've spent the most time thinking about is the nitric oxide pathway. Um, in which nitric oxide plays a, a pretty profound role in leading to pulmonary vasodilation and also anti-proliferation of the smooth muscle. For this pathway, phosphodiesterase type 5 um, binds with cyclic GMP to, to sort of turn down that pathway. And so phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors are used to uh, try and promote vasodilation um, and to lead to uh, the anti-proliferative proliferative effects of the pathway. So the first study looking at um, pulmonary vasodilation was done by Alessandro Giardini and published in 2008. Um, in this study, he recruited 27 patients, um, nine of whom served as a control group and 18 served as the treatment group. He brought them all in for a cardiopulmonary exercise test for training purposes so they'd get comfortable with the equipment. About two weeks later, he then brought them back in for the study. Um, for the study, they did a baseline cardiopulmonary exercise test, and then the control group uh, received a placebo, and the treatment group received a single dose of 0.7 milligrams per kilogram of oral sildenafil. Uh, 120 minutes later, which is around the, uh, when peak activity of sildenafil would be expected, um, they performed a repeat exercise test and looked at the change from baseline. What Giardini's group saw was that um, after sildenafil, there was an improvement in cardiac out, 
uh, in cardiac output in, and in pulmonary blood flow um, at rest, and an even more marked improvement in cardiac output and pulmonary blood flow um, at peak exercise. There was really just a very mild change in, um, in systolic blood pressure after sildenafil um, and no really other significant uh, side effects. Jonathan Rhodes and his group at Boston um, looked at another pathway, the prostacyclin pathway, and used inhaled iloprost, although they had a very similar mechanism where they had, or a very similar study design where their uh, study patients had a baseline exercise test then received a dose of inhaled iloprost, and then had uh, a repeat exercise test. Some received drugs, some received uh, placebo. And you can see that there was a significant improvement in uh, peak oxygen pulse, peak oxygen consumption, and percent predicted peak oxygen com consumption after uh, a single dose of inhaled iloprost um, as compared to placebo. Alexander Vandenbrun in 2013 published a really interesting study where he looked at the impact of a single dose of oral sildenafil on uh, measures of exercise performance using um, MRI ergometry or an exercise bike that was compatible with an MRI machine. Um, all the subjects in this study had uh, arterial lines as well as central venous lines, which are allowed for measurements of cardiac output uh, and calculations of pulmonary artery pressure, uh, pulmonary vascular re resistance, and ejection fraction. What you can see uh, in the graph on the left is that at rest, there was a decrease in pulmonary artery pressure after a dose of sildenafil, and that decrease um, relative to baseline increased the more significant the level of exercise. So uh, at rest, there was a small decrease. Um, at low and moderate uh, exercise, that decrease um, was a little bit more substantial. And then at peak exercise, there was a, a difference of about uh, four millimeters of mercury in pulmonary artery pressure. So pretty substantial uh, difference with a single dose of sildenafil. Uh, similarly, and perhaps not surprisingly based on that, uh, sildenafil led to a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance at all levels of exercise. Uh, and again, the most profound difference between um, between baseline and sildenafil was at uh, high intensity exercise. When we look at cardiac index, um, the news is likewise good. After a single dose of sildenafil, cardiac index uh, increased at uh, rest, at low, ex at low um, exercise, at moderate exercise, and then increased the most relative to baseline at high intensity exercise. I think one of the findings that was most interesting of this study was that ejection fraction uh, increased at rest and all, all stages of exercise as well with a single dose of sildenafil. Now this study didn't get at the potential mechanism for the increase in ejection fraction. Um, it certainly could be uh, improved filling leading to better starling uh, mechanism or it could be a direct myocardial effect. We really don't know mechanism but it's very interesting to see uh, an improvement in, ve in ventricular performance. So this is a study that I did uh, with Jack now a number of years ago where we looked at um, 28 patients and we randomized them to either sildenafil or placebo for six weeks. Then they had a six week washout period and then they flipped. So those who got sildenafil initially uh, got placebo and those who got placebo got sildenafil. And this allowed them to serve as their own control. And what we saw was with sildenafil, uh, there were improvements in oxygen consumption, primarily at the anaerobic threshold, although in this small uh, pilot study, it didn't quite reach statistical significance. This did reach statistical significance in those subjects who had a baseline uh, BNP greater than 100, which we defined as our heart failure group, and also uh, in those who had a, 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 base, a, left ventricular, a single ventricle that was left ventricular morphology or mixed ventricular morphology. Um, to follow up on the Vandenbrun study, we also saw an improvement in myocardial performance. Um, the MPI is a measure of both systolic and diastolic function, and we saw a statistically significant improvement even uh, in just our 28 uh, subjects in the myocardial performance index. This is a more recent uh, study looking at, uh, at Bosentin um, and the impact of Bosentin specifically on peak um, on peak oxygen consumption with exercise. This was done by uh, Anders Hebert and colleagues. And they showed a statistically significant um, and small improvement in peak exercise performance 
um, after treatment with six weeks of bosentin relative to placebo. One caution um, about the uh, bosentin study is that bosentin was associated with a small change, a small decrease um, in hemoglobin level. And we know that uh, anemia uh, is something we want to try and avoid in the Fontan. So this was a little bit of a concerning finding um, in this study from 2014. So all of this work together sort of raises the idea of would a pulmonary vasodilator work as a long-term therapeutic option in children with a Fontan circulation? So the Pediatric Heart Network, together with uh, Mezion Pharmaceuticals, uh, formed a collaboration to try and study this in a little bit more detail. This was the first time the Pediatric Heart Network had, uh, had formed a collaboration with private pharmaceutical. Um, and this particular program was designed to evaluate eudenophil, which is a novel PDE5 inhibitor, in adolescents with uh, Fontan physiology. We started with a phase one, phase two pharmacokinetic dose finding study, and then followed that up with a phase three double blind placebo control trial based on uh, the dose that was determined in the phase one, phase two trial. So the phase one, two trial was a dose escalation trial at five different doses. These were our dosing strategies, 37.5 milligrams daily, 37.5 twice a day, 87.5 milligrams daily, 87.5 milligrams twice a day, and 125 milligrams daily. We enrolled six participants per cohort, and then we also did a limited evaluation of, of efficacy measures um, with low expectations of finding any changes of significance given the small size uh, of the cohort. So these are the uh, plasma concentrations of uh, eudenophil and DA8164, which is the primary active metabolite of eudenophil over time. Um, the sort of aqua blue line represents the 87.5 milligram twice a day dose. And the light green line is the 125 milligram uh, once daily dose. Both of those had, uh, or those two dosing regimens had a very similar peak plasma concentration um, but the 87.5 milligram twice daily dose was associated with a, a higher av average plasma concentration, and neither of them was associated with dose limiting side effects. When we looked at, um, at efficacy measures, not surprisingly, we did not see any change in uh, VO2 max or exercise performance in the small uh, sample of patients um, uh, in this phase one, phase two trial, but we did see an improvement in the MPI, similar to what we'd seen um, in the sildenafil study at the 87.5 milligram twice daily uh, cohort, the cohort all the way uh, on the right. Again, this was very similar to the finding from the sildenafil study, and, uh, and our conclusion from that study had been that uh, sildenafil improved short-term measures of global ventricular performance and cardiac output, and now we have uh, additional evidence suggesting that eudenophil at a dose of 87.5 milligrams twice daily has a similar effect on the myocardium. So that phase one, phase two study led us to, uh, the, led us to the FUEL study, the Fontan Eudenophil Exercise Longitudinal Trial. The primary aim of the FUEL trial was to determine the effect of six months of treatment with eudenophil using that 87.5 milligram twice daily dose on exercise capacity in adolescents with single ventricle heart disease. Secondary aims included the effect on the ventricular performance, the effect on uh, peripheral arterial tonometry, a measure of, of uh, peripheral vascular function, and the effect on serum BNP level, a marker of heart failure. We enrolled uh, adolescents 12 to uh, less than 19 years of age with Fontan physiology. Um, all participants had to take an exercise uh, test at baseline, and, they to, and in order for that exercise test to count, they had to sh demonstrate maximal effort with an RER greater than 1.1. Um, if they did, they were randomized. If not, they were deemed ineligible, although even those who were ineligible were given a second opportunity uh, to meet the randomization requirement um, if they so chose. Once they, were, uh, once they were in the trial, they were then randomized to either eudenophil at 87.5 milligrams twice a day or to a matching placebo. And again, the primary endpoint was the change in peak VO2 from baseline to 26 weeks. Uh, we also looked at other exercise measures, uh, including importantly measures at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold. We looked at the myocardial performance index, uh, 
the reactive hyperemia index and brain natriuretic peptide. The primary efficacy endpoint was the between group difference in change in peak VO2 from baseline to 26 weeks. And for the primary outcome, missing data was imputed as equal to baseline. So in other words, if a subject had baseline data but not 26-week data, we assumed that there was no improvement. Secondary analyses were performed with available data, but missing data was not imputed for the secondary analyses. Uh, for the, the, the baseline uh, characteristics of the eudenophil cohort and the placebo cohort were quite similar. Uh, the average age was about 15 and a half years. Uh, about 40% of participants were female, about 80% were white. About 50% had a, a systemic left ventricle. Um, about 30 to 35% had a patent fenestration. The average height was about 162 to 165 centimeters. The weight was about 58, 59 kilograms, and the BMI was uh, 22. Here are our data. We present the baseline data along with the change from baseline to 26 weeks. Um, you can see that peak VO2, which was our primary outcome, had a positive change in the eudenophil group uh, versus essentially no change in the placebo group. But even with a sample size of 200 per group, our p-value was just 0 0.071. If you look, however, um, at the exercise data at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold, you can see an improvement in oxygen consumption at VAT, uh, an improvement in work rate at VAT, and an improvement in ventilatory efficiency. So all of our parameters at the, at the anaerobic threshold demonstrated a statistically significant improvement. Um, and our, our parameters at peak exercise uh, trended towards an improvement, although it didn't quite reach statistical significance. For our secondary outcome measures, uh, the myocardial performance index, again, demonstrated a significantly uh, positive improvement with eudenophil re relative to placebo, consistent with all of the other studies looking at ventricular performance. But we saw no change in the uh, log of the reactive hyperemia index, and we saw no change in the log of the brain type natriuretic peptide. Here's a visual um, uh, depiction of the improvement uh, with eudenophil relative to placebo. Uh, the panel on the left shows peak ox so oxygen consumption at peak exercise. In the middle shows oxygen consumption at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold. And on the right shows the improvement in work rate at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold. Again, for all three parameters, the outcome for eudenophil was superior to the outcome for placebo, and for the measures at the anaerobic threshold, uh, that difference was statistically significant. So an important question for any clinical trial was, well, great, it looks like it may be efficacious, but is it safe? Um, and in the field trial, we demonstrated a relatively good safety profile. Um, there was a slight increase in headaches in the eudenophil group relative to the placebo group. There was uh, an increase in facial flushing in the eudenophil group relative to the placebo group. And there was an increase in reported erection, obviously for males only, in the eudenophil group relative to the placebo group. Um, there was uh, also an, an increase in epistaxis, or bloody nose, in the eudenophil group, although that didn't quite reach statistical significance. We know that PDE5 inhibitors can be associated with uh, bloody noses, so that uh, is, certainly goes with um, with uh, our existing knowledge. So again, the side effects that were seen more commonly um, with eudenophil were headache, facial flushing, and increased erection, all of which had previously been described. So in conclusion, treatment with eudenophil at 87.5 milligrams twice a day was not, associ not associated with a statistically significant improvement in oxygen consumption at peak exercise. It was associated with statistically significant, statistically significant improvements in submaximal exercise performance measured at the ventilatory anaerobic threshold. It was associated with an improvement in myocardial performance index, as we've seen from many other such studies looking at PDE5 inhibitors in this population. And it was not associated with changes in the reactive hyperemia index or in brain type natriuretic peptide. It was well tolerated and safe with adverse events primarily limited to those known to be associated with PDE5 inhibitors. So what are the cl clinical implications? Well, the circulation after the Fontan requires a different approach to pharmacotherapy based on the unique features of the physiology.
Pulmonary vasodilators have now truly been shown to have an important role in the overall approach to treatment of those with single ventricle heart disease who have undergone the Fontan palliation. And eudenophil is unique among pulmonary vasodilators in that it has, it has undergone phase one, phase two testing along with a rigorous uh, phase three clinical trial. So I do want to thank uh, all of these organizations along the bottom, the Pediatric Heart Network, um, Mezian, Mended Little Hearts, Pediatric Congenital Heart Association, and Sisters by Heart. All of these groups were instrumental, um, were instrumental in the collaboration that allowed the FUEL trial and much of this research to be successful. Thanks, Dave. That was a fantastic presentation uh, and an incredible, incredible achievement. And we'll talk about uh, some of the rigors of, uh, of that achievement uh, uh, in a moment. But uh, let, let me start the conversation by um, sort of uh, picking your brain a little bit on what else we can be looking at. What other regulatory systems might be uh, able to be manipulated in a favorable manner? I think, um, to me, what the FUEL trial demonstrates is that pulmonary vasodilation, to some degree, can be achieved uh, in patients with a Fontan circulation. But I think, uh, as we've talked about and you've heard from, from many folks after this, this landmark study, one of the questions is, to what degree is that physiological change truly translatable into an important, significant clinical uh, improvement uh, in, in some way? And, and what other... so. If, Perhaps it will play a role, and pulmonary vasodilation is key. We know that when there's pulmonary hypertension in these patients, they don't do well. But what else should we be looking at that perhaps can place pulmonary vasodilation within a spectrum of regulatory mechanisms, of biological mechanisms that we can perhaps wrestle with and improve to alter the, the quality of life of our patients with single ventricle? Right. Well, uh, that's a great question. That's Actually, many great questions rolled up into one question. Um, but to me, uh, I think the improvement that we demonstrated with eudenophil is important. I think if we can improve exercise capacity um, in a broad population of a heterogeneous group of, of Fontan patients, um, we've demonstrated uh, something that's significant for the field and significant for the individual patients. Now, what does that mean for every individual patient? I think we still uh, have to learn that. Um, but I think for the population, we've now demonstrated that there is a pharmacotherapeutic approach that can have an impact on the overall hemodynamics and physiology. Is eudenophil uh, a magic cure for the Fontan circulation? Definitely not. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's one piece of perhaps the approach to therapy. And I, I don't even want to say pharmacotherapy, but just overall therapy for the Fontan, because I think the fon therapy of the Fontan or treatment of the Fontan can be looked at in different ways. There's certainly a pharmacotherapeutic approach, um, of which I believe eudenophil is an important piece, but then there's other non-medical approaches which are likely um, equally important. So just sticking to pharmacotherapy for a minute, um, Again, pulmonary vasodilation makes sense and seems to be effective, but are there other agents that can um, reverse some of the processes uh, associated with the Fontan circulation? We're learning more and more every day about liver fibrosis uh, in the Fontan. The liver is one of probably many organs, the heart included, uh, that have fibrotic change as a result of low cardiac output and elevated central venous pressure. And so we need to start thinking about ways that we can slow down that fibrosis or reverse it to some degree um, to prevent the long-term sequelae of cardiac dysfunction or, um, or of liver cirrhosis. So um, an agent like spironolactone, which is known to have uh, antifibrotic properties, uh, makes a lot of intuitive sense and would be useful to look at uh, more systematically to see if something uh, like that can perhaps be um, a useful part of a drug cocktail for uh, those who have undergone Fontan. Um, but looking at the non-pharmacotherapeutic approach, um, there's certainly a lot of evidence to support the idea of exercise. Now, all of us know that exercise is important um, for our cardiovascular fitness and well-being, 
Um, but we believe that exercise and particular, particularly uh, strengthening of the lower extremity musculature can really help to, to create a sort of pseudo pumping mechanism uh, for the Fontan circulation um, to unload a little bit that central uh, or the venous system to, and to improve the circulation overall. Um, and those of us with two ventricle circulations, obviously um, we have a subpulmonary ventricle to pump blood through our lungs. Um, exercise is good for us in a different way. Um, but for those with a single ventricle physiology, I think the importance of exercise can't be understated. Strengthening those lower extremity um, muscles and creating a, a muscular pump to augment venous return, I think is probably critical to the long-term health of those with a Fontan circulation. You know, you, you mentioned uh, spironolactone. Uh, I totally agree. We've had many conversations about its potential role. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, potential antifibrotic. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, drugs that's been around from the perspective of treating uh, heart failure. Uh, lots of work in the adult realm uh, in looking at it, and not so much in, in the pediatric realm. You know, what is interesting, though, is that the renin angiotensin system, which I think we can perhaps safely say is likely perturbed in some manner <laughs> when you have a Fontan circulation, um, we still, uh, to a great degree, utilize uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors. It's a relic from when we were hopefully believing that there might be a drug therapy that could be helpful for these patients. And so I think it's probably safe to say that ACE inhibition has not made a major difference uh, in these patients, either from a ventricular performance perspective. Perhaps we really haven't focused on end-organ consequences just yet. It would be interesting. But spironolactone as well influences the renin angiotensin system at a later point uh, in, that, in that pathway. So I do share the, uh, uh, your, your view that I think if we re-look re at that, we might find some benefits in inhibiting that in some way through some agents that, that are available. Any, anything you can share uh, with us about the role of PD-5 inhibition and your thoughts about how that, even though... Uh, yes, pulmonary vasodilation and an influence on exercise capacity. How does PD-5 inhibition potentially influence, say, liver fibrosis or any of the other organs? Well, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> we don't know the answer to that just yet. Uh, we do have an ancillary study to the FUEL trial, which is just about to uh, wrap up, where we look at um, magnetic res res MR elastography of the liver to look at liver stiffness before and after a treatment with eudenophil. So we'll know a little bit about whether it impacts the liver stiffness. Um, but even if eudenophil decreases liver stiffness, it's, it's going to be hard to know uh, whether that's an impact um, related to the decrease in central venous pressure that we believe is associated with eudenophil or if there's some truly antifibrotic property associated with eudenophil. I think from a mechanistic standpoint, um, that would be a really interesting thing to look at uh, as we go forward. Yeah, yeah, and of course that, that begs the, the next question or statement, which is we are in need of a mechanism to separate liver stiffness uh, and its components, right? It would be great if we had a, a tool right. that could allow us to, uh, to assess the uh, fibrotic load of a particular organ uh, versus the congestion of that organ, separate those two elements and best understand the, the combination that contributes to the elastography. If we could do that, we'll, we'll have some interesting uh, ways of characterizing our Fontan patients as they go forward. So it's a, it's a work in progress. I work think. in progress indeed, yeah. yes. Yeah. Let me shift focus for a moment here and, uh, and um, you know, thank you and your group tremendously for what you and the PHN have done uh, in terms of coordinating what is safe to say is the largest uh, trial in congenital heart disease to date, right? 400 patients that were enrolled, right. 30 centers in North America. I mean, that's, you know, for many of our adult colleagues, that's standard fare, but it's really an achievement. Uh, and uh, kudos to you and the group for achieving that in, in congenital heart disease. Any particular experiences that you can recount for us? Any lessons learned uh, from the experience itself that you could share with us? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for uh, the congratulations. It, um, it, <clears throat> it was an achievement of many people, um, and I'm 
<clears throat> it was great for me to be part of that team along with Steve Paradon uh, and many others. Um, in terms of lessons learned, I think, uh, you know, it really highlighted the importance of teamwork. When you're uh, collaborating with 30 centers in North America and around the world, really, we had two centers in, in Korea, um, you really sort of have to make sure everybody's on board and going in the same direction. And for us, that required some face-to-face -face time. This was pre-pandemic, so we were able to travel and, and visit with our, our investigators at, at various sites. Um, and it, it, it meant a series of phone calls, um, sometimes every two weeks, sometimes once a month, just so that everybody could get together and discuss the trial um, and check in and make sure that we were moving forward. Um, it really required a lot of coordinated uh, effort and collaboration from a very large number of people. And frankly, that was one of the most enjoyable aspects of the trial was getting to work with colleagues um, from so many different centers and getting to interact um, with so many different people from uh, around the country um, and Canada and even getting to know some new people um, in South Korea. Awesome, awesome. So. Finally, let me, uh, let me ask you something a little, little bit uh, that's uh, not medically related, but uh, I know is another one of your passions. Uh, and, uh, and that is the, uh, I'm going to refer to it as the game of baseball. Uh, others might refer to it as the sport of baseball. Uh, it's, it, it's a sport slash game that, that, that I love, but um, I was uh, always interested to hear your, uh, and to learn of your particular interest in it and your passion for it. Uh, and such, even to the extent that um, I now know that uh, you promote that particular activity amongst other uh, groups in your community and, and the youth and such. Tell me a little bit about, about how you've developed your love for baseball sure. and, and, and what it is that you're doing within the Mount Airy community today. Sure. Um, so uh, when I was a, a, a young child, I lived in Philadelphia and I actually lived in, in Mount Airy, which is the neighborhood where I live today. Um, and when I was six years old, the Phillies won the World Series. Mike Schmidt was the third baseman and Steve Carlton um, was the star pitcher. And as a six year old, I would listen to the games on, I had this little uh, transistor radio and I would sit on the porch and I have a, a vivid memories of sitting on the porch with my mom um, and listening to the Phillies games on this transistor radio. And I just became enthralled with the sport and with the characters and, and the way the game was played and sort of the pace of the game and listening to it on a summer evening on the porch. Um, the whole thing was something that I really fell in love with. When I was eight, I moved to uh, the suburbs of New York where everybody was a Mets fan or a Yankees fan. And I was uh, deeply imprinted with Philadelphia sports by that time. And so being surrounded by Mets and Yankees fans um, really only furthered my love uh, of the Philadelphia <laughs> Phillies, for better or for worse. Um, and that really stayed with me uh, through college and uh, residency. I was uh, a displaced Phillies fan for a long time, um, but I maintained my love of the game. There's something about listening to a baseball game uh, in the evening while cooking dinner or doing the dishes or whatever it is. It just really creates a nice pace and flow uh, to the evening. It's a, it's a wonderful sport. You can listen carefully when it's exciting or it can provide a, a great background distraction um, when that's what you're looking for. Um, and then when we moved back to Mount Airy, um, all of a sudden I was surrounded by other Phillies fans and, and very quickly the Phillies became um, one of the most uh, fun and exciting teams um, that they've ever had, with a, uh, which culminated in the 2008 World Series. And along with a couple of other colleagues from the Cardiac Center, uh, we bought season tickets and we were uh, fixtures at the Phillies games for, for a long time. Um, and my son was three in 2008 when they won the World Series and, and my daughter was a newborn. Uh, and so they both grew up, or in their very formative years anyway, in, those, in that time period where the Phillies were great. And for a while, um, baseball was for us a way to spend family time together in many ways. We could, we'd go in the backyard and pitch wiffle balls to the kids um, or we'd listen to the game and talk about the strategy. And then as my kids got older, it became something to do as part of a community. Um, and many people probably aren't familiar with Mount Airy, but Mount Airy is a, a relatively unique community um, in, in how integrated a community it is. It's um, racially, ethnically, uh, socioeconomically, very diverse uh, neighborhood. 
Um, but even within that diverse neighborhood, most of the institutions in the neighborhood are a little bit isolated. And one of the beautiful things about sports is the way it can bring people from all different parts of the community uh, together for a common purpose. Um, and it's really, to me, when, when you see the community come together in that way, and, and there's really nothing like the Mount Airy Playground uh, on a Saturday afternoon in the middle of baseball season, where people from all imaginal, imaginable backgrounds come together uh, in the pursuit of 10-year-old baseball, um, it's really, it's fantastic. And, and as much as I loved the opportunity to spend time with my children and family through baseball, it also provided me an opportunity to help create community within our wider community. And that, and that was something that was, uh, and, and continues to be very meaningful to me. Well, that's, that, that's fantastic. I, 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 in this conversation, I'm already seeing some parallels here between <laughs> trying to bring uh, a team of, say, nine or 10-year-olds together to play baseball uh, and the parallel of trying to get leaders from 30 congenital heart centers together to consistently perform an exercise stress test in the same way and to have uh, consistency in undertaking a, uh, a clinical trial. So. Um, it looks like those skill sets certainly uh, reside in you, and uh, I want to congratulate you for, for both of those achievements and look forward to many, many more opportunities where we can continue to work together and recruit our colleagues around the world to help focus on solving some of our problems for our kids with the Fontan circulation. Absolutely, Jack. There's a lot still to be done, and I look forward to, uh, to working with you and our friends and colleagues from around the country and around the world to continue to uh, move forward on the problem of how to improve the Fontan circulation. Great, great. Well, thanks so much, Dave. And thank you all for your attention and uh, for listening to this, this fantastic talk and, uh, and life lessons and life advice. Uh, we are very much interested in your feedback and we'd love to hear questions concerning our content that you've heard, as well as suggestions for additional topics that would be of interest to have reviewed in depth and discussed. In order to communicate with us, we have a dedicated email address. It's chopheartalks at email.chop.edu. We'd appreciate hearing from you. We'd love to hear your ideas and suggestions. Thanks so much for your attention.